Del Spoonmore, as, as she mentioned. Uh, my wife, Carrie, is it's with me here today. We, uh, we created our, our app together. Um, I'm going to be talking more about what led up to this, and then we'll get into the app later. So basically, this is, is basically what, what led to the app. Um, three years ago, we had never grown anything in our lives um, successfully. I, I will weeds. I've grown a lot of weeds. But food, never anything I could eat. And um, back then, we kind of decided we wanted to start growing, starting off just some of our food, and then just kind of see where it went. And as you can see, it, it went a little crazy. And, um, and this is the story of, of how and why that happened. So for me, this really starts back before I met Carrie. And this was me back when my first daughter was born, Brooklyn, in 2008, about 10 years ago now. And I was 340 pounds, and I had a lot of health issues. I had my gallbladder taken out at 24, I think. I had just a lot of issues. And when she was born, it felt like this moment where uh, I, I was being asked, you know, what kind of father do you want to be? And I decided in that moment that I didn't want to be this guy because I couldn't run around and do anything without huffing and puffing. And, and I wanted to be someone that could run around with my kids and coach our soccer team and, and be that kind of dad. So that's really what started the journey for me. And, and back then, I, I really focused on the weight loss portion, not so much the what am I eating portion. And I started running marathons, and, and I, eventually I lost a lot of weight, about 120 pounds, and I went on the Rachel Ray show. And, and all of this ended up being a bad thing because it led me down this path that kind of built my ego up too much, and, and it really led to, to a crash. And, and I went through a major depression. And I was at the time I had, I've always had issues with anxiety and depression. I didn't know it back then. Um, I just knew that there was this monster in my life that, came alive every now and then and destroyed everything around me. And that's kind of, that's where I was whenever I met her. So that's Carrie. And um, I, was, I, I went through a, a really rough divorce and, and I met her the fourth day of January of 2013. And we've been together almost every day since. And this is really what started to change things for me. And I started to think more about, um, well, she's really the reason why I started to think about anxiety and depression because she was the first person that saw it in me. Before then, I just knew that this happened, and I had always found a reason to make it someone else's fault, or, you know, I, I, I hadn't owned up to it, and I, I tried to do that to her, and that didn't work. She was the first person, you know, in my life that said, no, like, you changed, something happened to you, like, we can fix this. And, and that led me to this book here called The Depression Cure that talked about how you can overcome anxiety and depression through natural methods. I tried the medication route, I have nothing against that. I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way it made me feel. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little autistic, and I, like, and, I, and I like being autistic. I like that I go on these crazy spirals where I dream up these things, and I go build that. I, I like that about me, and I don't want it to go away. But I also don't like the anxiety that comes with being autistic. So anyway, this book directed me towards, towards um, some key ideas, you know, drinking a bunch of water, eating the right foods, Specifically things that were high in magnesium and calcium, like broccoli and kale and cabbage. Uh, getting enough exercise was, was a big thing. You know, proper amount of sleep, being mindful, just being aware of what's going on in the current moment and not worrying about the past or the future. Uh, getting enough sunlight and enough social activity. And basically all of these things pointed towards start a garden. Because we started buying food and it was really expensive. So that's basically where the story of our garden begins. And I'm a nerd, so... I made it Star Wars themed, so bear with me. A New Growth, 2015. And my wife, uh, my, my family and I got started, and we started with the square foot gardening method, where we built a box. If you're not familiar with square foot gardening, it's built, the, concept, the gardening method was made by a former engineer, and basically you take a, a raised bed, you divide it into square feet, and then each foot you plant, you know, a, you treat that like its own little space. So carrots, you can fit 16 per square, and you just plant carrots in that square. Then next to it, you plant something else. So peas are four per square. And, and each square has a certain number. And, and I loved this because it just made sense to me, and, I, and it made it so I could memorize it quickly. So I, I dove into square foot gardening. Um, the problem it was that square foot gardening was written by a guy in the north. So a lot of the things talked about there did not work here. So I made a lot of mistakes the first year. You can see them now. Look at those tomatoes. Like, I thought those were going to survive our summer in those little baby pots. Like, I just, I didn't know what I was doing. And I made every mistake in the world the first year. It was one of our early watering methods, trying to get the kids involved. <laughs> and um, 
so po uh, compost was, was one of the first things the book talked about as being super important. So I really dove into building up a good composting system. So um, we started off by getting you know, compost we bought in bulk. Now we, we, we make a lot of it ourselves. Um, so we started here. My daughter loved it the first time they you know, dropped it in the back of the truck and it kind of makes the truck go and kids love that kind of stuff. This is our first compost bin. Uh, I'm going to show a lot of stuff and pretty much everything that I'm showing, we have a guide on how we built on our website. So if you have any questions about any of that kind of stuff, you know, like I have pretty much everything up there or in our app at this point. Um, so at the end of the first year, this is what our backyard looked like. And this was the other side uh, where the compost area is now. And, and this is where I want to show some of the mistakes we made because this is just a, one example of it to where the Square Foot Gardening book talked about companion planting and about how you do that by interplanting squares. And it talked about how peas and carrots were companion plants. So I thought, well, I'll just checker pattern it, right? Well, I didn't think through like what was going to happen when these peas got four feet tall. And now I've got to trellis them with individual TPs for each square, like you see here. It was just, it was a nightmare. So, and the reason for that, a large reason was because, you know, I'm, I'm carrying around all these books in the garden. I don't want to take them out. And it's, you know, and, and as I've worked in software development my whole career, so I started thinking back then, it'd be really nice if I had an app that would let me keep track of all of this because there's all this stuff I'm having to manage. So that was kind of where the, where the idea started was just the frustration around, you know, encountering some of these issues. And then the next year uh, we really dedicated, well, let me go into this. So the Bermuda Strikes Back was the second year where we dedicated to overcoming some of the problems or, or hopefully all the problems we had the first year and trying to engineer better solutions to solve those problems. So. We started off, uh, well, let me start off with this. So Mary was born, my third daughter, and she immediately, like within minutes of being born, she was like, I'm hungry, feed me, and she hasn't stopped. So we knew we had to get to, to work building more gardens. So we did, and we started basically just uh, covering our entire backyard in cardboard because I was tired of dealing with Bermuda grass. Up until then, you can see these gardens here were just constantly inundated with Bermuda coming in. I spent all my time pulling Bermuda. It was very frustrating. So um, I tried some of that, you know, the black weed cloth fabric stuff. That stuff doesn't work at all for Bermuda. So that was, that was frustrating. And, and basically, I, I had stumbled on the back to Eden garden method, uh, which is basically you cover the yard with cardboard, and you cover that with a foot of wood chips. And then that decomposes. It suffocates out the, the Bermuda. And then as, um, as that decomposes, worms come up. And eventually, you're left with really good soil in the place. So I started going down that road. Initially, really just to cover the Bermuda and to build raised beds on top of it, which is still mostly what I have, but I'll get into that and what we have now here in a bit. But you can see how I started covering basically the entire yard with cardboard and then building raised beds in and around it. And then um, I do want to talk about the soil mix that goes into the raised beds because that is the most important part of it. The, um, I mentioned compost earlier, but there's a mix that you, uh, that you include other things in with that. So the soil mix that I use is the Mel's mix, where it's one-third vermiculite, one-third compost, and then one-third peat moss. You mix all three of those together and then put them in, in, the, in there. You can back off in the vermiculite because it's pretty expensive. Um, so I've backed off to about a quarter in the vermiculite, and then I've just substituted with extra compost instead, and I haven't had any issues with that so far. Uh, well, no, it's a, it's a, that's the point of it is to help you hold water with water conservation. So when you have drought period, it, it sucks in the water and then it releases it slowly, you know, when you have. Um, but I, but again, like especially, um, I'll talk more about smart pots here in a little bit, but I've backed off on vermiculite because of using smart pots and other things that make it where I don't have to as much. Um, you can see we continue to cover. And then one day this happened. So the previous agreement Carrie and I had was that I could have this whole row along the fence and, and not much more. But then I had a really bad day at work and I work from home and I spend like half my day outside and half my day at the computer and, and I did this. And she came home <laughs> and I was like, hey Gary, can you come look at this? And she came out, I was like, that actually looks good. And I knew that this whole half of the yard was, was mine for the taking. So that was when I basically just started taking over the whole yard from there. Um, I wanna talk about wood chips for a moment because all of the wood chips from our backyard, we've got for free. And we have loads and loads of wood chips. You can get them from the Norman Compost Facility. There's other compost facilities. Um, but don't pay for wood chips, please. You can get them for free. It's, there's also a service called Chip Drop, where you can sign up. Um, and local landscaping companies, when they cut down a tree and then run it through their chipper, they'll have a whole truckload they need to unload. So you can sign up for the service. So when they have you know, a need for it, they find the closest address and they come dump it. 
Uh, I've had that dumped on my place tw twice now, where we've had big loads drop. So, um, and it's a huge load of wood chips, so you better be ready, because it's, it's, it took us like three days of <laughs> moving wood chips. It was fun though, I kind of like it. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is these raised beds on legs, because we built these primarily to understand the problem and that we didn't fully understand how the sun worked when we first started our gardens. So the first raised beds we had were down on the ground here, and this fence um, casts a shadow. You know, the, the, the later it gets, gets into the year, the more the, the, the shadow is cast. So raised beds that were, that were fully in the sun in the summer were now fully in the shade in the fall and spring, and we couldn't grow there. So the idea was to build these raised beds to get them up off the ground on legs, to get them into the sun. Uh, they work really well in the spring and fall when we don't have super rough temperatures, but in the extreme heat, they dry out really fast. In the extreme cold, they get really cold. So I don't really use them really for growing in those seasons. It's mainly for our salad bar in the spring and in the fall. It's great for that. We just sprinkle in different greens on the top there, and then it's where the rabbits can't get to them. And it's just where it's super easy to harvest, and that's primarily what we do there. And then this happened. So my, my grandfather um, passed away around, I don't remember the date, but anyway, he passed away. And I um, volunteered to speak at his funeral. And before then, I'd never really done any speaking, nothing like this. Like, I was terrified in front of crowds. And, um, and anyway, I spent that entire week just out in the garden kind of letting him speak to me. And that was the moment for me where gardening became something I was doing to grow food for my family and to something I had to do to survive. You know, kind of like my place to go to. And that's really when that kind of connection happened to me. And I built these three gardens in one week. And I spent literally the whole week out there, uh, out there till 3 a.m., like, you know, all night just doing that nonstop. And, and that's really when I started to realize that I was feeling pretty good. My Panic attacks were pretty much gone. And before that, I mean, let me describe what a panic attack is. I, I get these from time to time where I'll kind of, I'll start feeling anxious and then like eventually it'll kind of boil up and it'll turn into this kind of heat that rushes over my body. And like, it kind of like, my whole body starts shaking like uncontrollably and I start like panicking and I can't breathe. And then that happens for indefinitely. So like 10 to 15 minutes sometimes and I can't control them. It's along for the ride. And those are terrifying because you don't know what's happening, especially when it first started happening them are having them and, and those pretty much were gone. And it was like, I, it was like overnight, I, you know, I, it was, they were gone. I didn't even realize they were gone. And that's kind of what gardening did for me. And it was that realization of how important this was for my mental health. And I still experience that today where I, I went through a few months back, I was not in the garden very much. I was on the computer way too much and they came back. And it's, it's very, it's direct correlation for me where if I, if my garden looks terrible, my head feels terrible. It's a direct correlation. So um, that's, it's a pretty good barometer for me to know like what's going on in my head or what's coming is go look at my garden, see how it's doing. So we also had a lot of success around this time. So we were getting tons of food out of the garden. It was like, <laughs> we were being overwhelmed with food. Um, by the way, these zucchini baseball bats are actually super useful. You can milk them. Carrie makes zucchini milk out of them, which she uses to make bread as a replacement for milk in our bread recipe. So. Um, she has, she has like 27 zucchini recipes on our website, by the way. We went a little crazy with zucchini last year, or whenever that was. But, um, but we were having a lot of fun during this time. And we were starting to innovate a little bit because I was tired of watering. Because we had a really, you know, like we expanded quickly and it went from watering a little bit, like having to spend like 30 minutes watering, to now spending a lot of time watering. So um, I looked into the, some of the drip irrigation systems and I. I still believe that's the, the best way to go, or like the, the black drip, you know, tubing, that, that whole method. But I couldn't talk her into letting me spend that much money <laughs> I been on it. And PVC pipe is cheap, and I watch a lot of YouTube, so I was like, I'll take a shot at that. Um, so basically, these are just PVC pipes with holes drilled every three inches, the smallest drill that I have, which is 1 16th. And then you hook it up to ignore that. I ditched that idea. And what I do now is just hook it up directly to the hose. So, um, and then this spits out water, you know, evenly across the bed. And I have an orbit timer that, that controls the watering on it. So about 15 minutes is a pretty good amount of time to completely soak that bed. And I know when it's done because water will start running out the bottom of the raised beds. And that's when I know. And generally about 15 minutes is the right time for that because it puts out a lot of water. So I built these. Uh, I definitely think this is a great system for if you only have a maximum of four raised beds. 
And the reason for that is because you can only water one raised bed at a time with this system. So with a four outlet timer, it's not too big of a deal because you've got like four little hoses going or whatever, right? But once you get to the level we're at, where we have like, I don't know how many beds we have now, up to 20 or whatever, it becomes annoying because you've got to move things around constantly. And it's just, I basically ditched this now and I just do a lot of overhead watering. Um, but when we were at this level, it worked really well for that. Um, I still think the best way to water is the drip irrigation tubing if you can afford it, where you just have the black tubing and you have the little emitters. Um, I have that system set up at the Baptist Children's Home Garden that I help run because um, we had some budget to build it out there. So that was uh, that was really nice. It's a, and the reason why is because it's much more efficient with watering. Like you, I could water like your entire, I could water my entire garden off one timer basically on those instead of here I've had you know, all sorts of different timers set up. So this is showing how it running basically just the water coming out every all on the way. Uh, this is a, a rainwater collection system that we built. We have a guide on on our website also. Um, it's just IBC totes we got off Craigslist for about 60 bucks and then the hardware to hook it up is not, not too expensive. But this gives us about 800 gallons of rainwater collection, which is nice to have. Primarily, I, I use this mostly with plants that um, look a little sick. Um, if I'm going to give them some fish fertilizer or something like that, I want to give it to them with water that is the same temperature as the plant to reduce shock. So it's just one of those things that the square foot gardening talked a lot about was um, the tap water. The water coming out of the tap is significantly colder than the air, and that can shock the plants. I'm not too worried about the whole chlorine thing. I mean, I know there's a big debate about that. Um, but this is mostly just so I have water on hand. It's the same temperature. And then eventually, I would like to get into building what you guys have, the, the water ponds, and then possibly have this funnel into the water pond and then irrigate out of the water pond into my beds so that I'm irrigating with fish water into the beds. And like I'm, it's kind of like a, a natural aquaponic system. So I'm using an in-ground pond. Because I know that if I have an aquaponic system that's above ground, I'm going to do something wrong and I'm going to have a giant flood. It's just going to happen. If there's a way to screw it up, I will do it. Um, where I figure it's an in-ground pond, you know, I've got nature on my side. It's helping me out. So, um, yeah, so another thing that we learned that first year was that um, full sun in Oklahoma is not really what you want to have for a lot of vegetables. <laughs> So up until then, I, I had thought, ah, shade, I can't plant there. Well, then I started to embrace shade the next year. So I, I built raised beds on the east side of every single thing that I own, basically, east side. I always get that confused. I know which side, I just say the wrong one. On the side, they get shaded in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, we also rebuilt our compost bins. And this is, the reason why I showed this is because I want to show that you can build things cheap, too. So our Previous raised beds were built out of like Lowe's lumber or whatever. We spent some money on that. The next generation of builds, beds that we built in the compost bins, we made out of pallet lumber that we broke down and then rebuilt into this. And that was pretty much all free except for, there was maybe some posts. I think most of these posts we got actually off of fences that were blown down. This is around the time we had some tornadoes in the area. So we're blown down fences on the side of the road everywhere, you know. So you can go pick those up and then just cut the panels off and you got, four, you got posts that you can use for stuff like this. So I just kind of piled that stuff up for a year and then just built everything out of it. No help too, it wasn't just me. That was a fun day. We had a saw and we just tore a bunch of stuff up and built stuff. So this is something else we, we did um, because we wanted to grow over the winter. And up until then, we can grow kale and spinach through the winter for the most part without protection. But everything else needs some protection like carrots and uh, peas and broccoli, uh, not broccoli, uh, beets, uh, anything like that. You can grow through the winter if you give it some help. So these are hinged covers that we built to go over our raised beds. We built them like this because the first iteration of it had these domes that were kind of fixed. Let me show this picture. You see how it's built. These domes were fixed into the bed. and It was a pain to unflap and take it off and get things out from time to time. So on this, it's just hinged so you can raise it to harvest. And so these are, these are really nice for that. These ones that are on the raised beds on legs aren't as practical because they get too cold underneath. So I've, I've built them on the raised beds that are directly on the ground now because those hold heat a lot better. And also you can switch them out to use insect netting instead of the plastic sheeting. So this is really uh, helpful, especially for cutworms, because cutworms took out probably a third of our beans the first year. And Carrie was out there with toothpicks, putting toothpicks around the beans, because that's one you can help with cutworms, is to put toothpicks on either side of the bean, and the, the worm can't wrap itself around the plant, because that's how it chews it. It wraps all the way around the plant. So if you've got a toothpick next to the plant, it can't do that. So anyway, she put toothpicks on beside every single plant. It took her like an hour, <laughs> maybe longer. <laughs> so anyway, this is how we solved that toothpick problem, which is. So what is this 
This is insect netting. And it's also shade cloth, so it kind of doubles. It's Agrabon 19, 19%. So it's, it's really not a lot of shade, I think, but it's really more for the insect netting more than anything. They have different levels you can get to of various shades. So you can use it for shade cloth too. It's not super tough. I mean, it's not gonna last more than that one season. So don't expect to be able to reuse this, but it's cheap. It's a lot cheaper than that plastic stuff. And you could double it up and make it a little bit tougher. But it's great because it lets light and water in, but the insects can't get in. Now you'll still have aphids and little things like that. They're still gonna find ways in. But you know, the big flying moths that lay there, you know, like those, the cutworm moth is pretty big. So uh, it's, I have, we haven't had any issues, any issues with cutworms on our beans since we switched to that. Mm -hmm. So I start with plastic, and that'll, we'll have plastic from, not necessarily the first freeze, because a lot of those crops don't mind the frost. In fact, it makes them a little bit sweeter. So I don't really worry about the, the cold until we start getting down into like 28s, you know, and then like, we're consistently around that level. Then I'll switch to the regular plastic. And then you, the reason why I don't switch too early is because you have to vent them, um, even on this level, and it's a pain, and I'm, I'm a terrible gardener when I'm in control because I just, I, I forget. Like if, I, if I'm in control of, of watering, I'm terrible. But if I set the automated timer and it does it, it does it for me, it's good. So that's kind of how I view about venting because I'll get my own little world off coding something and you know, it'll be, it'll be 80 on a day in January and there goes all of my plants. So that's why I don't switch to that plastic too early because you can fry your plants, you know? So I try and, and the insect netting is really, I mean, kale and spinach, kale comes from Russia. So it's bred for winter. It does great in the winter. It'll grow all, now it's not gonna, if you plant it in the fall, it's gonna grow to a certain stage. It's gonna go dormant in the winter, stay that same level. And then in January and February, it's gonna explode and you're gonna get a ton of growth off of it. So, but it's a really easy way to get a jump start because otherwise, if you're starting kale in January or February, you're not really getting that plant producing until April or so. Otherwise, if you've got this one you started in the fall, it overwinters, this starts shooting out in spring. Now it's gonna die before the one that you start in April. So you still start one in you know, early two, and then that one catches up and it keeps going. So that's kind of how we phase our plantings is we always, always have fall stuff that rolls into the spring. Did that all make sense? Did I explain it? Right. Um, so our grow light system. This is something else we built to save money. The first year we bought all of our plants as transplants. Also, I wanted to start trying to grow heirlooms and things like that, so we want to start our own seeds. We built this for less than, less than 150 bucks, just buying supplies off Craigslist. This is just a wire shelf rack. And then these shop lights, I, I find on Craigslist all the time because businesses are switching to LED lighting. So they're just, these lights are always out there for sale. And I got these for maybe 10 bucks each with the lights generally. So it's a pretty easy way to get started with growing seeds and to save a lot of money. And again, we've got a guide on our website that talks all about how we built this and all that. Um, trellising, something else I want to talk about. This is a really cheap and easy way to build trellises. So these cattle panels are at Tractor Supply for $13, they're eight feet. And then these T-posts here are pretty cheap too. In fact, T-posts I get for free on the side of the city all the time. People are constantly putting them on the side of the road. So you can take those and just attach it with zip ties. And that's a really nice way to have a trellis. I, I, I wouldn't really use it for trellising tomatoes like that because it's a bit of a pain, but for beans and the vine squashes and things like that, it's just a really nice way to have a trellis. I also flip them so they're a portrait. I mean, it's not the right orientation, but I think you'll know what I mean. Um, to where they're tall, so they're eight feet tall. And then they have eight foot T-posts at Tractor Supply. So then you can get really tall trellises. And it's pretty cool to use that for like loofahs and things like that. Or you can get these cattle panels that are like 16 feet long and then arch them over and then have an arch. And I think I have a picture of that coming up that we'll see at some point. Um, smart pots are something that we started using more of. Is anyone familiar with smart pots? They're, they're fabric raised beds. You can see them here. and um, I'm not going to get too much into them, but basically the idea is that <coughs> normally plants can only absorb oxygen from above. These plants that are in smart pots are able to absorb oxygen from the side as well. So they use a little more water because they're going through more, through more, more of a respiration process, what do you call it? But um, I have noticed significantly better growth in these as compared to raised beds that are right next to them. And more than anything, I think they're easier for people to get started with. So. And we've, well, one thing we've been doing with these two is experimenting with growing a lot more plants in smaller space by doing things like taking a tiny smart pot, like a one gallon smart pot, putting a pepper in it. And then that pepper primarily stays inside of a kiddie pool that we fill up the bottom two inches with water like every day or so. And then it drinks that way. But we can have a ton of plants inside that kiddie pool. 
because instead of a pepper being limited to that one square feet and then kind of the space around it, you have to worry about root space and all that, it's inside that. You know, I'm, I'm experimenting to see how small we can go with Smart Pots. Like, the, re the recommended is probably like a five gallon, but um, I'm working with a guy from Smart Pots to kind of test this out and see what we can get away with and what works. But if it works in Oklahoma in the summer, it should work anyway, work anywhere. But that's the thing I love about these Smart Pots more than anything is being able to just put them in a kiddie pool. So whenever it needs to be watered, you can take a kiddie pool, fill it up with like, not too much water because you don't want the roots to get soggy, but about that much water, you just set it in there and then walk away. And then it absorbs all the, all the water from below. And then the next day you take that one out and then put a different one in. And that's, it's made it a lot easier. Um, and it's, it's on, our, on our porch area, we're only growing a smart pot just to test the idea of only growing food that way to see how well it works. And so far it's been going really well. Um, we added a bunny because we had some issues with um, horse manure contamination. So before we were making our compost from horse manure primarily was our main ingredient. But we found out that the horses that we were getting the manure from were feeding from fields that were sprayed with a long-term uh, a long-term herbicide called aminopyrrolid, which can last in their manure for up to three years. Long story short, it wrecked all of our tomatoes the first year. So what we determined from that was that we were no longer going to bring in outside animal products because we have no idea what these animals are grazing on. The chemicals out there are too prolific. It's just not worth it. So we thought, well, a rabbit is the best. You know, we looked it up. The rabbit is the best manure to use because it's the most uh, balanced out of all the animals. It's not as hot in nitrogen. And the Flemish giant is the largest rabbit I can get. So we got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I found a rabbit breeding group on Facebook and asked around if they want to have any Flemish giants. And sure enough, we got a Flemish giant breeder here. So she always has new litters. So if, if you want a, a giant, and he's awesome. He is cuddly and he loves the kids and loves Carrie. His name's Roger. <laughs> the pet. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, this is around the time that our son was born. So this is Junior, and this was leading up to, so this was November of 2016, and previously in that year, uh, we had lost a baby, and we had gone through this whole emotional ordeal from that, and um, I don't know, we were, we were both like kind of just at this weird place. We were like super stressed, but also relieved because we, we had a healthy child that was born, and, and that was also during the time of the election. So don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going there too much. I will say, this is what we did. We were super stressed out, we were waiting in line to vote, and my daughter Mary, which was a year and a half at the time, she was playing on the ground and she bumped into the people behind us. And they got to talk, and I'm not super social. Um, I don't want to talk to people, I'm just kind of reserved and whatnot. And she kind of got me into a conversation. And that conversation ended up being with someone that worked at the children's home that works, that's behind my house. And up until then, I had looked over my fence at this children's home, and every Tuesday I saw them mow their huge field, and I thought, why are you mowing this field? You need to be growing stuff there. You know, like, that's what I kept thinking. And, I, um, and now I had been introduced to the person that could actually help me make that possible, right? And then the next person I meet is uh, kind of heard me talking about gardening and saw my pictures and I was showing, because, I mean, this is all I talk about. Um, and, and they said, we've always wanted to grow food, but we just moved here, and it's been so hard. Like, how do you do it? And I felt like in that moment, I was being asked, if you're so worried about the world and what's going on in it, and, and grant, this is before anyone, this is, I was going to throw this no matter who won, just to be clear. This is, just, this is based on how we've treated each other in the country, just, just all this, right? I just feel all this. And, that, and basically it was, if you feel this way, what are you doing to fix it? And my answer was, I guess nothing. I'm not doing anything. And, and I felt like then I was being shown, well, this is how you can help fix it. And, up until then, I'd really been thinking a lot about uh, building a mobile app to make food grow, you know, and just, and just had this fire within me, you know, that comes with four kids and being stressed about the world. And that we basically, from that moment uh, until still, our life has become trying to help people grow food. And that's what we do with when I feel stressed out about the world and I can't sleep, instead of reading the news like I used to do, I either write about gardening or we edit a video about gardening, or I code about gardening, I do something to help people grow food. Because that's what I can do to fix the problem that I see in the world, right? Because I think if more people grew food, uh, there'd be less anxiety, less school shootings, less everything, right? Because that's what helps me. So this is the way that we make our impact, and this is what we started doing. We started with um, a website first. Um, this is before I, I, I knew how to code. I had to learn how to code before I could make the app. And 
We started with a website where, okay, is this gonna work? No, it's not. Oh, I messed it all up. Bet I can hear it faster than. You do that real fast. <laughs> I need some interlude music so when I mess up, I just pop it out like doo doo doo. I don't have so many slides. It makes it really <laughs> uh, Okay. Can you press the button now? Because it's supposed to. See, like, I shouldn't have even done this. It wasn't worth it because it's, it's just press anywhere. Well, that's on the actual button. That's the screen. Never mind. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Just never mind. Right, um, so we started a website where we started like uh, writing about how we did. So basically, this presentation started as a blog post, and we started writing about stuff like that. Watch, well, just gonna do it whenever I go to the right now. No, it's not okay. So like basically, this like, these are the same pictures you already saw. So we started doing that. You know, just starting by building a website, sharing what we learned, and then I started writing more about the anxiety and depression stuff because I started talking about it. You know, kind of just came out and and it seemed like that was something that people resonated with and it seemed like it made an impact so I, I started writing more about that and just talking about how I help my anxiety and depression and I say help because I have not gotten rid of it it's, it's gonna be a lifelong thing it's not something you get rid of it's something you can manage so that's what I talk about is the things that help me manage it so I started doing that um, and then we started shooting YouTube videos so just I, I still I don't do as much of this anymore, but we started doing a lot of just walking around the garden, shooting videos, showing what we're doing. It's super awkward, and that's why I don't do a lot of it anymore. And, and two, this kind of started with the idea of I had all of this information in my head that I had to get out, right? Um, this was not a very efficient way to get it out because I had this list of like 150 videos I needed to make. And I just started to get stressed out about all the videos I had to make, and very quickly it was an app would be so much more efficient. So that's kind of where this all pivoted into was um, I, need, I knew I needed to make an app. So I started learning how to code last year. Carrie started learning how to code too. Um, and together we started building it in about a year ago today or, or so. About a year ago we started building it. And then we released our first version in January. Um, let me skip through this. So. Okay, let me press it. So this is the app here. And I'm gonna talk briefly about what it does. So. It lets you choose whatever vegetable you want to grow. Oh, that isn't working? Oh, okay. Um, do y'all have a time? I'm worried about like running over y'all's time. Or, is there no internet in here? That I don't know. Okay. Yes, there is. There is? You know what the... Uh, This is a very old version of Windows. This is like going back in time. It's pretty cool. I like it. Blast in the past. Oh, can it? Of course it. Is. Oh yeah, that's why we didn't like those Windows. Okay. Well, um, can I see your phone and I'll just hold it up and show it, and that'll hopefully y'all will be able to see. Okay, and you can also download the app, or if you have a phone, you can just go to app.seedthespoon.net. That's a new website that we launched that works on any device. Um, so this will work on a Windows computer, uh, any computer. You can just go to that our website and click on a link and go to it. So if you don't have a mobile device, you can do that. But can everyone see the app? Yeah, on the website or on the. Yeah, if you go to seedthespoon.net. Oh, I'm sorry, seed to spoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you have the app open, you can choose whatever vegetable you want to grow. So I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose beans, and then once you have beans pulled up, it's going to give you a brief summary at the top of you know what, why we like beans, you know something about it, and then we're going to give you exact planting dates for when you can plant those beans based on your nearest weather station. So we find the nearest NOAA weather station, and we pull the um, first frost date or the prob most probable first frost date for that location. You can actually customize this. If you go into settings, you can scroll down, and then you can go in here and see, uh, if you choose NOAA dates here, you can see the probability. 
So on April, 10, April 12th, there's a 10% frost chance for Oklahoma City for right here. Um, a 20% chance on April 6th. So you can customize how risky you want to play it. By default, we're going to do the safe options. But we'll give you the planting dates for spring and for fall. We just added fall in an update last week. Um, so and it gives you three different options, kind of like the early, the safe, and the late. Uh, and these are going off of the recommended planting dates from sources we found from all across. So we've matched all these dates up against OSU just to verify they're accurate for here. Um, you know, specific because we live here, but we've also got feedback from all around the country. Um, it doesn't work out of the country. We have found out that I don't have access to the data outside of the country, so it kind of just, and also in, in New Zealand, it never freezes. I've got to figure out how to handle that. There's a lot of edge cases we've got to figure out, but in Oklahoma, it's perfect. <coughs> so we have information about how to grow it. So the number per square that I talked about, you know, the amount of days it takes to harvest it, the um, amount of sun it requires, how much watering it needs, how you plant it, whether or not it's by seed or transplant. And then if it's by seed, you know, how deep you plant it and how many days it takes to sprout. All these things I was constantly looking up just in one, one app. Uh, how tall it gets when it's, uh, when it's mature. That way you know like how, you know, if you don't plant something too tall on the, on the south side of something. And then what family it's in so you can help with uh, crop rotation, not planting something in the same place. And then we've got information about how to harvest and how to cook it. If there's any blog posts, um, we have links to products too uh, within the app. The things that we buy, things that we like to use, we have links in here. And then if anyone clicks on that link to buy, we get a small percentage of it from Amazon. So it's a free app, but it's supported through things like that. Um, we also have a button at the top where you can literally buy anything on Amazon. So people buy like garden furniture and like patio furniture to like help us support us. So basically anything you want to buy. You can get, you can get seeds and all that kind of on there as well. I don't have a lot of seeds on there because I really try and direct people to something like Johnny's or a place like that because on Amazon, there are like Dave's Garden is a pretty good seed vendor on there that I've researched that I, I trust, but you never know what you're going to get on Amazon. So you can buy seeds on there and I've linked to them in cases where I feel good about them, but I would love to get a partnership with Johnny's or something like that so I can send people to a seed company. And that's what I'm looking to do. Like that's what we're doing now is we're building partnerships with like Smart Pots and seed companies, companies I like working with and I believe in. We have people out there that want to grow food. I want to pair them together. And then if I can potentially get a small cut of that, then this can be a business, can be our full-time job. Because right now, I, I work full-time as a software developer um, for a company, and she works full-time as a nurse teaching nursing online and then working at a hospital. So this is our side project, and we would love for it to be our full-time job one day. Um, we also have uh, this, I guess we don't have a blog post for this vegetable, but if we did, it should. Oh, the internet thing. Um, so it'll pull in any blog posts that we have about that vegetable. So she does a lot of recipes um, where anytime she makes a new recipe or something, she puts out a blog post with a video about it. Those will all come in for that vegetable. We also have uh, the companion plants. So if you tap on companions, we show you all the things that grow well next to that vegetable, as well as bad companions. So things to avoid planting next to that. And then we also have a list of the pests that attack that plant. And you can scroll through and see a picture of the larva and the adult for each of the insect pests. Now we are really close to having a feature that lets you take a picture of a pest and it tells you what it is. We have a prototype working for cucumber beetles. Now I've just got to go get 200 pictures of every other insect. So <laughs> that's all I got to do. <laughs> the coding was the easy part. Now I got to get data. And then we also have a list of beneficial insects. So you can go through and see all the things that help in your garden and how to encourage them, type of plants that can encourage them and, and whatnot. We have a, a how to start tab that walks through basically how to get started growing food, all the steps required kind of what we learn through each step. We have uh, a list of all of the, the pests that are in the app in one spot. So that one you saw before were the pests that were for that specific vegetable. These are the ones that are, these are all the pests in the app now. And then uh, we have about tab that kind of tells our story and lists, uh, these are all the books we use to make the app. So we got links to all of them in here and uh, some of our favorite places. So this is the first version of the app that we've put out. It's completely free, it will always be free. Um, mostly because we feel like we were called to make this to help solve a problem. And if I put money in the way, then I'm not doing what I was called to do. So we're going to keep this version of the, of the app free forever. We're working on building a new add-on to the app that will help guide you. So you could, like, for example, you could mark when you planted something. And then we use that date to guide you through the process. So we'll know, we can check rainfall amounts around you, tell you when to water based on how much it's rained, uh, depending on the plant, too. So if it's something that needs water, we'll adjust for that. We can 
uh, guide you through planting, through knowing when to plant based on forecast information. So maybe this date says it's March 1st, but there's a cold front coming. So we'll warn you saying you don't want to plant your carriage yet or whatever. Um, we'll have this whole system that kind of guides you through that. So that's what we're building now. And that will be a pro feature. So that'll be like a whatever a month, you know, we, is the fair market value. Mostly because we're starting to get into territory where we're now we're, we're paying for servers and things like that. Because we, we released the app in January, not really knowing or expecting what would happen. And just kind of a couple out of our, you know, out of our living room in Oklahoma. And the powerful thing and the magical thing about being a software developer in 2018 is at the click of a button, you can get in front of the entire world. And so now people started searching for growing food and gardening, right? Well, just that, like, has now, if you search for growing food or gardening in the app store, we're in the top three for both of those search for terms. And so that has really turned our lives upside down in a way um, where we've had to, you know, think about things like quitting our jobs sooner than we originally, you know, or like, you know, what we get invested in, things like that. So we're, that's what we're doing now is trying to figure out if this is going to be our career or if this is going to be, but we got to, really what we're, our goal now is just to make the best gardening software. So that's what we're trying to build now. Um, build something that will walk you through everything you need to do. I feel like the app does a good job now of giving you the information, but you still have to know to go look. You know, it doesn't walk you through it. We want to make it to where growing food is so simple that you literally only have to download this app. And even eventually, we want to have a service where you can choose what vegetables you want to grow. And you get everything to, to grow that delivered to your door when you need it on a monthly basis. So that's what we're looking to build. Um, and that's our story. I, I think I covered... Everything that I, oh, current pictures, yeah. Might see you on they were here, and <laughs> friends were trying to get me to go, but I'm not going to go kiss up a bunch of millionaires. Like, that's just, <laughs> if that's what it takes to make it, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to make good software and hope that's all it takes, because I'm not going to, I wouldn't make it past the first round, because I wouldn't be able to handle their attitudes, like the way they treat people. Like, that's just, but we are, there is this really cool program here in Oklahoma City called Stitch Crew. It was started by the Thunder. And by Google and MidFirst, that's meant to foster tech innovation in Oklahoma City. And we're, we're in the process of getting set up with them now. And they should be able to help, hopefully, take this into... Because what, what really like got stressful for us was when we started... We wanted to make it where we could just sell things in the app directly instead of linking to Amazon. And I built the whole system to do it. We could charge a credit card and do all that. And we have SmartPot set up where they were going to ship it out for us and everything, too. But once I sell something, I now own customer data. I have, I have that person's information. So if we get hacked or something, it's like a million dollars per incident. Like I'm playing with the big fish now, you know, like, so like it was pretty overwhelming trying to research these credit card laws and all this stuff. So we backed off on that. And I felt like it was kind of a sign too of like, I need to be focused on building the best gardening software and not building credit card processing systems, right? Because, and whenever, and if it's, if I'm meant to do that, then there'll be someone there to help me do it. That's kind of the way I do life is when I feel like I'm going against too much friction and it's a sign and I need to refocus. So um, I'm hoping the Thunder program will help us with that. I've already told them about kind of those, you know, issues and whatnot. So, um, but right now we just want to make the best gardening software because I feel like the app is already like what I wanted, but I want to make something that's just like makes it just so easy that can really change the world. Like, I really feel like we have an opportunity to make it to where, you know, it's, it's brainless to grow food and maybe... If we do that, then people will try. I don't know. It's a gamble. I mean, but, but I think for me, it was tasting a spinach leaf out of the garden. The first time I tasted that leaf, it tasted unlike any spinach leaf I'd ever had in my life. It was, you know, it was kind of rough and it was, it had this texture to it. And once you take a bite out of it, it's like cold and crisp and kind of almondy. And before that, like the only spinach I'd ever had was out of like a Subway sandwich and it was like, like paper, right? You know, you don't taste anything. And it was, it was that moment. It was like, oh my gosh, my whole life I've been missing out on this, this thing right here, which is like with that added taste comes all the added nutrition that I've been missing my whole life. And adding that back in is what helps make my mind not go haywire. Because y'all don't want to see me when I'm under the waves. It's bad. It's... <laughs> It's real bad, so I, I got to keep that from happening. And and this is, you know, and this is uh, so this was from the spring, and then this was our this is the the hoop I was talking about. This is our garden about a month ago, but yeah, it's, a, it's a looking a little raggedy right now. It, it's like the I let the morning glories get a little too out of control because I wanted them to like you know make things beautiful everywhere, but they're making things a little too beautiful. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
Oh, these. Okay, so these are, are five gallon jugs. I cut the bottoms off and then I stack them just there in the corner. But what I use them for, primarily one is hell protection. So if we have a big hell store coming and I've got some tomato plants or whatever, you'll stick those on top of it and then kind of dig it in the dirt to get to settle. Maybe even put like a burlap over it, you know, but then uh, the hailstorms don't tear that stuff up. And then also, if we have a really, really cold night, you know, in the winter and I'm worried about my protection not being enough, I'll throw that on it too. Like maybe, I don't have to worry about that with cabbage or anything like that, they're pretty tough. But if I was trying to push a tomato plant maybe and I had it out mid-March and we got one of those cold snaps, that's something I would try and do to help with it is put that in there. Maybe even like, like a little tea light candle inside of there too to get some heat in there. You know, like little things like that. Cause you really want like, I try and think about my garden as microclimates. So that pepper plant is not like in my garden. It's, it's a little spot. What can I do in that spot to help it? So if it's something that likes some shade in the afternoon, then I'll just build a shade wall right next to it on the west side by taking tea posts, sticking them in the ground, putting shade cloth. And you probably I don't have anything up right now, but um, I'll just build a wall right there next to it. So that, that's how I view like my little garden areas or just individual little areas of what do I need for that plant that's right there. And I think strategic about how I plant things. That's what I want to do with the app too, is have a whole visual component with it. So you can draw out your garden and what you have. You can choose what vegetables you want to grow, click a button and it says put things here. And it puts it on the map for you, like on the garden of where everything's supposed to go. So that's one of the things that I want to work into that. It's kind of that idea of put a tall plant on the west side, like okra on the west side of a bed. And then that way in the fall, like my carrots, I'm planting right now on the east side of all of my tall plants. So that way they're getting shade in the afternoon. They're not getting burned up. The seeds aren't, are still able to germinate. Because that's the hard part with fall gardening is just getting stuff to germinate when it's still hot. Once you get into September and October, you're golden. So. Any questions or anything? You want me to go over anything more in detail? Oh, yeah. So this is our website and we have, um, so I mentioned before that we're on the iPhone and on Android. We are also now, if you go to our website, there's an app that you can use from any computer. So it's our universal web app. And then we are gonna have a version in the Windows Store and in the Mac Store pretty soon too. So pretty excited about that. There's been a, a lot of people have asked about that. I didn't realize not as many people had mobile phones. I guess I just didn't, I don't know. I live in a different culture. <laughs> It's been nice, so I broke my iPhone a few weeks ago, and I'm on this phone I don't know how to use. And it's been amazing, because I just don't know how to use it, so I just like haven't used it. So it's been kind of a nice break. It's a little harder to get all of it Yeah, and I, well, yeah, I'm sorry for that part. <laughs> yeah, we love blue foods. Oh, oh, so you can let them dry out, and then uh, peel them, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, give them like uh, Christmas presents or because people just think they're so cool. They are, you know. Yeah, um, and the way I do microgreens basically is this. So cabbage and broccoli, square foot gardening says one per square, technically 18 inches. Okay, that really annoys me because for three months I have like one plant here and then all this space around it, right? So what I do is I just sprinkle broccoli and cabbage in that whole area. And then I let Darwin do its thing and I just, you know, I let the largest one go and I thin down as they go and those are my microgreens that I eat. So we eat microgreens but not like grown in the traditional tray and like we've done some of that stuff. Um, again, I'm really bad at watering and with the microgreen stuff, like a day or two will go by and if, if I can't automate it, I will screw it up. It's just, that's my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She puts up with me. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, y'all.